noisy this morning. <laughs> We're alongside the A1. Um, this morning's walk is from Connington Village, uh, around to Home Village and back to Connington Village. And we'll be flirting with the uh, Glatton Airfield. You, you can't avoid it in these parts. So uh, uh, our starting point um, will be the Airfield Memorial site, uh, just off the old A1. Um, it should be somewhere just up here, right next to the old uh, water tower. Somewhere here. hard to hear myself talk above the traffic noise, unfortunately. Um, I mean, Glatton Airfield was a massive airfield. I, I think there was up to 3,000, just under 3,000 people on site uh, at any point in time. Uh, I, it was only operative from early 1944 to, to sort of mid-1945, so um, it, it sort of came into the war quite late, but boy, it was a big one. It was a bomber base packed full of B-17s, um, a lot of people here. Uh, this water tower sits in the far corner um, of the site, we, near where most of the what we call dispersed sites were based, where the airmen used to retreat from the airfield um, and uh, basically sleeping quarters, dining halls, all that sort of stuff. Um, they kept away from the airfield because they were too precious uh, to lose if there'd been a, 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 a a bombing raid of any sort you can lose the planes but you don't want to lose the personnel so as with all the airfields uh, they created in effect encampments for each of the little squadrons that made up um, uh, the people that were here and uh, they're all based around here. I'll put a map up um, and you can see several um, of these dispersed sites they're all dotted around where I'm sitting now um, there's nothing remaining nothing to see apart from the water tower which stands as a sole survivor and, and a marker uh, for the brave personnel that were here. So we're going to see bits and bobs of the airfield on the way round, but it's a trip to Connington Village as well as Home Village. It's not just about the airfield, but you can't avoid, you can't avoid the airfield. It, it is just so big and it really it does dominate this scene um, during the war years. So uh, we'll get off and see what we can find. Actually, this actually was one of the uh, one of those dispersed sites. I'm just going to check see if there's anything um, that proves they were here. Yeah, there's some stonework foundations. That's all they'll be. I can get through. Just some slight remnants, broken up stonework and brickwork from the foundations of the buildings, that's all it was. A mighty big water tower. Known as a Braithwaite water tower because they were made by a company, I think it was in South Wales, Newport, uh, down that way. Called Braithwaite and they, they specialised in making these all over the country. And this was always a standard design, I find a standard design on airfields, they all look exactly the same. 
the big one. This was the entry path, entry road, call it what you will, to the, um, to the camp, to the dispersed site. Uh, I don't know what squadron it was. I can't find a map that lists the squadron on for this, for this corner. Um, but they were based over there, behind this green shed, uh, next to the water tower, basically. And this was the, the path round to it. You can always spot wartime roads and paths. They're always made up of this bland concrete. We'll see plenty of this on the way around. Whenever you see this, you know whatever you're looking at had something to do with the old air base. Always used to puzzle me that it was called Glatton Airfield because Glatton's four miles away from here but apparently it was because just up the coast you've got uh, another airfield or you had another airfield called Conning's B and it was considered it was risky to have a Conning's B and a Connington in close proximity because you know crews coming back from the, the sort of battle theatre uh, in fog, in the dark, maybe with damaged planes, uh, could easily get confused uh, trying to find the right base, which could have been dangerous. So they called it Glatton. Uh, why they didn't call it Sawtree, I don't know, um, but it was known as Glatton Airfield, even though it's in and around Connington. used to be the old rectory here, 17th century building. Now known as the coach house. Or perhaps that's the one to the left, I think. That's the rectory there. New tree farm now. Just up ahead where that red car is, I don't know if you can see it. Um, that road never existed before the war. It was actually built by the Americans because it was the shortest route to the airfield, which is in the distance. Um, the road just used to bend round to the right, so they actually, the Americans actually built the road where that red car is. They built the bridge that it's sitting on over the brook uh, in order to give themselves a fast route through to the airfield. And you wouldn't get far back then because not far past that red car would be a, I guess they'd call it a picket post, um, security stop. I'll put a picture up um, in a mo. And you'll see, but that was the that was the main route into the airfield. Notice the changing road surface from uh, familiar tarmac to the bland concrete again. Classic American airbase build. Uh, the brook is Connington Brook. Uh, source is somewhere about two miles away from here near Glatton uh, and it actually winds its way through and via other drains out to Kings Lynn and into the wash. But yeah this used to be the uh, very secure path into the airfield as I say you wouldn't have got up here back in 1944. I'll put the picture up now you can see the picket post you could just see on the far left a sort of sign of a slight left turn. Well, that's where these gates are, it's where we're going. Um, but yeah, up in the distance would be access to the control tower and the airfield. Again, there were encampments all over here, um, left and right of where we're now at. And there's nothing remaining. Uh, this was a good, a good prime agricultural land and as soon as the uh, air base was no longer needed, it was given back to the farmer who owned it initially. And he wasted no time in uh, 
destroying everything and turning it back to good agricultural land and you can't blame him for that we might find a remnant of something but there's certainly not going to be any buildings as such When I do these walks, I always like to look at some old, I've got some old 1800s uh, maps carrying quite a lot of detail. And there's, there's often things on those maps that don't exist um, or don't exist as prominently on current maps. And you kind of think, well, what, what, what was that and what was its purpose? And just up ahead where you've got this green area on the right is a, a little area marked as a reservoir. It was marked as a reservoir on an 1880s map. Um, a reservoir for what, I don't know. Uh, it was supposedly manned, uh, man-made, should I say. It was, it was as a result of damming up the Connington Brook, which is just to my left at the moment, and I created a reservoir. I can only assume it was for the purposes of feeding livestock that were nearby. I cannot see that it was used for any other purpose. I mean, reservoir just means dammed up water. It doesn't necessarily mean it was for human consumption. Uh, but it's, uh, it is still marked on maps today, not as a reservoir, but back in the 1800s it was quite prominently marked as a reservoir. We'll take a look at it. It's certainly cut off from Connington Brook now, so yeah, it's interesting that it's still full of water. Yeah, bit of a mystery that one. Uh, it was dammed up for some reason. It doesn't look, well it could be for, it could have been for livestock. I can't think that it would have been there for anything else. It, it predates the airfield by quite some margin. I have to remain a mystery. The mystery reservoir of Connington. I was hoping to find on this track a sort of depression in the ground um, but it's marked on the 1800s map as a fish pond where they used to keep fish for the purposes of eating. Um, it was only a depression in the ground and I, I, I can't find it. It could be anywhere. I could be standing in it now. Um, it puzzled me somewhat because these fish ponds tend to be in the area of manor houses, you know, posh houses. And, and there aren't any around here, but I think there probably was once uh, a manor house nearby. I know there was a manor house in Connington that disappeared in the 1500s, but I cannot find where, where exactly um, it was. But I have a strong suspicion it was in this area to the right of us. Uh, and this fish pond was part of um, their setup. There is actually another pond just coming up, which I can probably see remnants of something coming ahead. Uh, I think that may well have been a fish pond. It wasn't marked as a fish pond on the old map, but it actually looks more like a fish pond than the one that was here, because they tend to be sort of elongated rectangles rather than circular ponds, which was the one that was here. But there's one up ahead that could be an old fish pond. That, I'm pretty sure, is a very old fish pond. I can't I don't think I can get over to see. I might have a clamber. See if I can get across. As I say, it wasn't marked as a fish pond, but that is a fish pond. Absolute classic. Elongated rectangular fish pond. Could even be, could even be fish still in there. But they in effect grew fish in here. 
and then would harvest them. Fish like carp were extremely popular and uh, quite elitist foods in medieval times and beyond even. Uh, but there would have been a manor house, there must have been a manor house or a posh house somewhere in this, in this vicinity. We're just heading back towards the Great North Road now. The buildings in front of us here are um, from Woolpack Farm, we're at the back of Woolpack Farm. Um, the big building, the tall building at the back, which we'll see from the front shortly, uh, used to be the Crown and Woolpack. Very, very popular pub um, with the airmen here. Uh, I've, I've spoke to many people um, that did serve here about 20 years ago and I tried to investigate this airfield and they all knew about the Crown and Woolpack. Um, it dates back to 1791, if I remember rightly. It even has links with Dick Turpin um, in many a book, um, but it's long since closed now. It didn't last too long after the war. Um, but if I remember rightly, you can still see the, the bracket on the front of it where the pub sign used to hang. may not be there now. I, I've seen it in the past, so hopefully it will be there. But uh, yeah, let's take a look. I do apologize for the wind that's blowing. It's quite a stiff breeze and we're walking right into it today. But Hopefully we'll lose it, <coughs> excuse me, lose it in due course. Just looking across the farm buildings and love the old buildings here. See the bracket on the front of the uh, white building just by the truck, which is where the old Crown and Wall Pack pub sign would have been hanging. Just coming up to Ratcliffe Corner, as I've always called it. Um, this is where Ratcliffe's the heavy sort of vehicle recovery team. You know, if you're a coach, lorry, bus driver, and you're breaking, broken down somewhere, or you're in a ditch, these are the guys that will come and rescue you. Uh, fantastic family firm. Had the privilege of working with them at a family wedding a few years back. And they've been here since 1927, so they're coming up towards their centenary. Um, very familiar bright orange Ratcliffe trucks. If you want to see what this corner, what this junction looked like a hundred years ago, look at this wonderful picture. Hard to believe that that was at this very point. The junction's changed significantly, but it was at this point. Oh, at least we've got out the wind a little bit now. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a noisy, uh, car fumey start to this walk. Unfortunately, I've got to walk along a pretty busy road to get to the village of home to make this a circular walk. Um, and we're doing that bit now. So we've got about a mile of trekking along a uh, uh, pretty dangerous road. So I need to be careful. There's a couple of things to look at on the way, if I can find them. Uh, but at least it's quietening down a wee bit. Is that another fish pond? Could be. Could also be a fire pit from the airfield. The airfields tended to have pits of water that they could access quickly in case of a fire, but this is right on the perimeter, so I think it's more likely to be an old fish pond. In the distance there is where the airfield would have been. Uh, there really is very little left in terms of buildings. Runways, we'll see later on. Uh, you can still pick up and they're quite spectacular, but yeah, buildings wise, there's nothing really to identify that as an airfield over there. But that's where it was in the distance towards those trees. 
Just coming up to the crossing of Homebrook. Uh, kicks off somewhere near Folksworth and again heads over, joins other brooks. But King's Lynn and the Wash, not a lot on it at this point. Somewhere over on the left there, in the field behind these trees, was the old bomb store where basically they kept the bombs and they use a lot of bombs when you've got a huge squadron of B-17s taking off every day. A uh, huge storage area for bombs. Uh, they kept them off the airfield in case they ever went up in an air raid or via an accident because that would have damaged a lot of aircraft. But I'm hoping we can find at least the path that used to go up to it. There's nothing else left. But I don't get run over. Well, I can't find a path and uh, I've sneaked through the hedge. I mean, it's hard to imagine because like most of the airfield, it just looks like a field. Uh, but this would have been a very busy place and a dangerous place uh, during the war years. Um, the bombs used to be stored here and they'd have these sort of small tractor type vehicles that would tow multiple um, wagons full of bombs across the road uh, to the airfield. I'll put up a few pictures. Uh, these are actually from Glatton Air Base's bomb store, so these would have been captured right in front of us. This looks promising. That is definitely uh, airfield concrete up ahead. So that's one of the two tracks. It was like a horseshoe uh, track arrangement that went around the bomb base and back again. Um, and this is definitely one of the tracks just to prove I'm not making it up. There you go. That would have headed right up into the distance and then hooked around and come back down again. Taking a break from that busy road. Found a little pond just through the hedge. Very nice. Looking forward to reaching the village of home and getting off this main road. Made it at last. Still in one piece. That's not a good road to walk along. Coming up to Home Church, Church of St Giles. Nice buildings down here. Nice little cow as well. Ha. Cute. Another lovely church. And like so many others, dates back to 12th and 13th century. Um, but was largely levelled and rebuilt again in 1862. Always love those twin bells on this church. As I say, I saw them once before at a wedding. Very nice. 
as I say, it was rebuilt in 1862 by a chap called Edward Browning, who I'm told was the mayor of Stamford at the time. I can't imagine he actually built it. I assume he was the architect. I can't imagine a, a, a working mayor um, actually out getting his hands dirty building a church. But uh, he was the he was the name behind it. First primroses of the season. I have a real soft spot for prim primroses. Definite sign of spring. I added this slight detour onto the walk last night because uh, I've been very curious in recent days about something I never knew about previously with this airfield, mainly because it's not on the airfield. Uh, it's actually in the village of Home, or more precisely in Homewood. Um, there was a, a secretive operation, if I can call it that, called Op Operation Carpet Bagger, and it was based here in Homewood. And, uh, and their, their job, their goal, um, was to pack up provisions, presumably including weaponry, and load up planes and get them to drop those provisions behind enemy lines to those that were acting as resistance against the Nazis and basically everyone behind enemy lines that was on our side and they used to bring all these provisions in by train at home station just down the road and then off onto lorries I've got a picture here of them loading the lorries and they would travel in convoy to the area we're approaching now uh, where there'd be multiple sheds of workers that would be loading these uh, um, I suppose they probably looked like bombs, but they weren't bombs, they were packed full of provisions and then they'd move on to the airfield and uh, use the aircraft there to get them over behind enemy lines and drop them. Probably an extremely valuable operation called Operation Carpetbagger. And I wanted to see if there's anything remaining. I can see something already that uh, looks like it's an old building. I can't tell you much about it, but at least it's something to see and touch as it were. Site H was what it was known as. The, the, the name that was given to the area was it was Site H. I didn't tell you much else but that. As I say, I can't tell you there are no site plans for this area. I don't know whether it was just so secretive they didn't want people to know, full stop. Um, this definitely was one of the buildings, if not more than one of the buildings. And you've got that telltale concrete track coming in from the left that you can't miss. No idea what it was, but I suspect it was just one, one of very many packing sheds where a lot of work was done. Gated entrance. There's another building in the distance there that looks to be I think from the same period and it's got a roof on it I think definitely worth having a look I've got some more across the road there which I can't get to now we're just on the edge of the grounds of Homewood Hall here and that'll be another old building from Site H Foundations of another building.
unfortunately unfortunately it's the uh, wrong side of a barbed wire fence I'm not going to try and rip myself to pieces to get around it but uh, yeah still standing and that will date back to 1944 and operation canopic bagger the wonderful Homewood Hall I had the privilege of working there a couple of times as a wedding photographer lovely building just coming out of the churchyard now uh, very school I can't see any date stones and I can't find any evidence of a date online either but I don't know late 1800s mid 1800s um, but yeah village school uh, we have a date spoke too soon 1891 not far off I'm not sure it's talking about the school or the school van, it says. Interesting. The Home Millennium Sign. Nicely done for something quite recent. Vicarage close. We must be near a vicarage. That I believe is the vicarage, or was the vicarage. Could still be the vicarage, but probably not. I don't think it goes back too far. It's not a listed building, I think it's 1800s. Looks 1800s. Nice gaff. I'll put up an old picture of, um, we're just coming out of home now, but there's a picture of a pub here. It used to be the Railway Inn. Uh, closed in the 1950s, I believe. Um, great old photograph. And there's the building today. Used to be a blacksmith's next door, marked on the old maps, a smithy, but I'm pretty sure this is a complete new build. I might be wrong, it doesn't look like a smithy to me, it looks like a nice house, but it's on that site. This site coming up behind the green fencing was the site of a massive fire. Yeah, August 2022 hit the news. A lot of fire engines here. They've levelled it now. Last time I saw this, the burnt out buildings were still there. Well, you've got the burnt out wood there anyway. Deliberately burnt arson, apparently. Crossing uh, Homebrook again here, which we crossed earlier on that busy road. Probably got a bit more water in it now. Not a lot. Lovely old building here. Brookside Cottage. It's a strange one because I looked on the maps and it suggests from the maps 
it's actually quite recent so it may have been built to look old uh, it doesn't seem to show up on old maps so a bit of a weird one anyway as you can see we are coming up to what is Peterborough stroke Connington I guess airport now private airfield um, this isn't where any significant part of well there was a significant part of the old airfield here it's where the old technical buildings were mainly to the right of this um, but this is where they set up their base for the new airport there's an old hangar here um, I'll zoom in a wee bit we'll see more when we get closer there's an old hangar on the left here um, that I'm pretty well I guarantee you it's from the war years from the war years of uh, Latin airfield I think it's an old blister hangar it's been modified now to be the sort of main hangar for this uh, um, private airport Seventh Bond Group, appropriately remembered. There's that hangar. I'm sure that's a blister hangar. Blister hangars used to be dotted all around this airfield. Very simple, one aircraft hangars scattered around the perimeter, so you could scatter your aircraft around the airfield. Somebody bombed it. They wouldn't get too many of the planes. There'd only be one in each hangar. Right, as we swing around off this bend as you'll notice the road goes straight and that is because the road was laid down on one of the three runways of Glatton Airfield in 1944-45 you may well have seen B-17s coming along here you wouldn't last too long if you collided with those. Over to our right, apologies for this wind again, over to our right is another runway and this one is still in use. This is the runway used by the Flying Club here at Connington. Gives you an idea of just how big these runways were and they needed to be for the planes that were coming down on them. This runway was just as wide as that one was but obviously the verges on the side have made it narrow enough to be a road. I guess they could have left it that wide but uh, not necessary. There's a shot of that hangar. In case you're confused by the, the fact there's two runways there, there's actually three on the airfield, or were three on the airfield. They're all surviving to some degree, even if one of them's a road. Uh, this was what was known as a Class A airfield or A Class airfield. I used to think that just meant it was an important airfield, but it actually is to do with the layout of the runways, which was absolutely standard uh, for all of the sort of US Army Air Force bases. They all had this. They're all Class A. Well, all the ones I've ever seen are Class A. And if I put up this aerial shot from the war years, looking down uh, on the layout of the airfield, you can see where the A comes from. It is simply the layout of, um, of, of the three runways, really. It makes the letter A. Um, so this is where two of them cross. Um, I've also put another map up now that shows where we are um, on that same layout, on that same diagram, where we're, where we're at, the Green Cross, and the direction we're going to be heading in for a short while. It always seems weird to be walking along what was actually a runway. You can see from the road, it's either a Roman road, which it isn't, or it's a big aircraft runway. It's just dead straight. In the distance there is Rose Court, Rose Court Farm. 
And again, anybody that served on this base will know about Rose Court Farm. Uh, they're the people who own the lands here on which the airfield was built. Uh, the owner obviously didn't farm during the war years. He had to be uh, moved out, but this, this stayed in place. I think some of the outbuildings were used. My guess is probably the, the, the main farm building was also used by the sort of uh, senior personnel of the airfield. It was their HQ, but Rose Court Farm sat at the heart of this airfield. I mean, I've just stepped off what was the runway. There'd be another runway over the back of this one. Uh, it just sat there right in the centre of this hub uh, of wartime activity. Saw it out and then after the war, the farmer came back, ripped up all the, well he didn't rip up the runways, but flattened all the buildings and basically turned it back to agriculture. But Rose Court Farm very much right at the heart of uh, Glatton Airfield. Another shot of Rose Court Farm in the sunshine. A survivor wouldn't have lasted long if this airfield was uh, bombarded, sitting right in the centre of it. Just coming down to Connington North Level Crossing on the East Coast Main Line. Uh, it's just a typical countryside crossing. Only this one isn't typical because it carries the tag of the crossing of death. It also carries the tag of being Britain's most haunted level crossing. You want to know why? I ain't afraid of no ghosts. <laughs> I'll tell you what, sun shining, blue sky, it's a lovely day. Um, nothing spooky about this place, but if it was twilight and it was getting dark, I'd probably clear off. <laughs> Just heading up towards the third of the three runways at Glatton Airfield. I always think the most spectacular one, even though they all look the same. Um, this was the first one I ever found. It's a, it's a, yeah, it, it's just, uh, uh, it, it just hits you. It's big. You just kind of think any moment a B-17 is going to come over those trees and uh, land right in front of you. It's a fantastic sight. We'll get a bit closer in a moment. I meant to mention earlier, um, the reason you have this A-shaped layout of the runways is to try and make sure that the planes can always take off into the wind, whichever way the wind is coming from. The main runway, I think, went from southwest to northeast, but if that wasn't the best for getting these heavy bombers off the ground, then whichever, whichever runway meant they could take off into the wind, that's the one they shifted to. And that's why they make this A formation. Let's get up a bit closer. There you go. Gives you an idea how big those planes must have been to need a runway like this. I was reading the other day, apart from 12 inches of concrete on top of the, uh, um, the footings, the footings themselves, uh, the hard core that was used for the footings, was brought up over a period of time on trains coming into home station uh, from London. And it was, the, it was the, the, the fallout, I guess, from the bombings in London and the blitz and whatever. Uh, there was so much rubble down there, they piled it onto trains and brought it up the uh, railway to, to help build these runways. There's something ironic about that, um, with the Germans bombing London to pieces or parts of it, and us shoveling it up to build runways to send planes back to give it back to them. 
Um, but yeah, they had to be mighty strong, robust runways to handle the planes that were landing and taking off from it. Church Lane, on which there'll be a church. There it is. There's Connington Church, All Saints Church. Uh, there's been a church on the site since the Doomsday Book, so you know, a thousand years plus probably. Uh, but like all of them, rebuilt 18, I think it was 1841. Uh, so most of that is mid 19th century. Somebody asked me in a week, why do these churches, why were these ch churches, sorry, rebuilt uh, so frequently in the 1800s? And uh, there's not one answer really. In, in most cases, it's because it was too small. Um, the, the original church, that is, was too small. It needed to be bigger. We were a, undoubtedly a more God-fearing nation back in the mid-1800s and there just wasn't the room. There was a demand to attend services and there wasn't the room so it needed to be made bigger. They didn't look like this pre-mid-1800s in most cases. They were much smaller. Um, population growth is the other big reason given. Um, population was growing so I guess it's more of the same really, just wasn't big enough. Um, I think there's a third reason, I'm trying to remember what that one was now. Oh yeah, I think it was uh, an upsurge in um, certain architectural styles, particularly the Gothic style. Uh, architects were itching to get their hands on buildings that they could put their stamp on, and churches were ideal. So um, it was a bit of a bit of all three, really. So most churches went through a pretty massive upgrade in the 1800s. Some of them almost literally rebuilt. But I'm hoping we can get in to this one because it's actually a redundant church. Don't get many of those. Uh, it actually is not a church. I think they have two services here a year, uh, but officially it's, it's a redundant church. It's not owned by the church. It's owned by a preservation trust and good on them for keeping it going. And uh, we may have problems getting in, but I hope we can get in because there's, uh, there's definitely some memorials to the airfield in there I'd like to see. Uh, we'll give it our best. Wellington House Private, that's not it. I don't think we can get in there. Uh, right, undeterred. Got to be a way in. the fences here. Right. Don't try this at home children. Crazy, you can't get in, redundant or not. Nice fence. Ah, we're in. Oh. Now they're trying to shoot me. Spectacular church. 
well worthy of keeping going or at least keeping going as a building and not uh, left to dereliction very nice very poignant memorial I've seen this before I don't know what it is just a look on the face uh, and he's looking out across the airfield which is behind me and in front of him it's a very deliberately positioned said here here bless them all I think there were 730 ish that flew from here and never came back that's quite a jaw-dropping number There are only known to be two buildings, unbelievably for such a big airfield, but only two buildings that are still standing from the war years. One was the water tower where we started, and the second one is this one. Now this is building number 155, which is the standby set house. And it's off the airfield, because the airfield is over there and the reason it's off the airfield and probably why it survived is because it contained generators fuel tanks uh, the word standby comes from the fact that it would be put on standby should there be an air raid or a power cut or whatever you couldn't afford for the airfield to close down so this would kick in uh, this would have the means to power the airfield so it was a very important building and it's still standing water tower aside the only one still standing quite a big building and you've got the concrete path leading back to the road Just my luck. I turn up at the building, the chap in a tractor turns up at the building. I can be there because I'm on a footpath, but I might have had a rummage around the building if I uh, had it to myself, but alas, it wasn't to be. I can't actually show you the site of this one because it's behind the trees and I cannot get a view of it, but it's, uh, it used to be Connington Castle, which wasn't a castle. Uh, it was a very, very elegant, um, 16th century um, estate house basically and it's very significant because for hundreds of years you know probably 50% plus of the village of Connington worked here uh, in one form or another whether it was a, a maid or a, a, a butler or a gardener um, you know if you, this was the major employer uh, but sadly and surprisingly it was completely demolished well not completely there was a tiny bit left which i can't show you because as i say it's behind the trees uh, but i think it was 1956 something like that it was demolished i'll put this picture up and you can see what a fantastic building it was um, and very very sad to lose that i cannot tell you why it was demolished but it really shouldn't have been um, that would have been a very popular place to visit i would suggest if it was still standing Uh, building in the centre there was Connington School. Um, it's changed a lot, uh, not just since it closed, uh, but even in recent years, the little things that made it look like a school have gone. I've got, I think I've got a couple of pictures here, one of it in its earlier days, when it was a school, and one of it more recently, when it wasn't a school, but still looked a bit like a school. Um, and now it's been upgraded even more. But there you go, it's a private residence, so these things happen.
just coming up the track that used to lead to the site of the 749th Bomb Squadron. Um, they were based in this field. This is where their buildings uh, all were. And there's absolutely nothing left. Um, but this was their site, this was their patch, this was their track that led from the village up to their site. There's a few bits of concrete still surviving. Just to show that it was part of the airbase as it were. But yeah, this whole field would have been pretty busy and noisy. Well, I'm going to walk back down the track now. I only came up here to, to reenact a photograph I've got um, from the war years, and the exact spot I needed to be. A car came up behind me where well, you saw it and parked right on top of it. <laughs> I could have cried, but she's moved it now, I think. So I'm going to go down there and I'm going to grab that photograph. Right, here's the original fantastic photograph of a picket post, really. Security uh, for getting onto the site. I'm going to try and capture that one from pretty much the same spot. There you go. Same spot. Amazing to see what looks like a village green with housing around that have been here for a long, long time. But of course, they haven't because in the war years there was nothing there apart from. Air Force uh, buildings. You know, I mean, it was part of the, it was the other side of the gate to the airfield, and you had things like the dining halls and various other buildings here. It was only when the Americans left, really, that it became populated with what you see before you now, with houses and football pitches. Um, but if that bridge had not been built to the far left, um, you would have no access to this. I'm sure someone else might have built one. Um, but yeah without what the Americans did in making this an, uh, an entry point to the airfield, then you wouldn't have these, uh, these houses. A lovely village sign with the B-17 flying above the church. In front of the goalpost, there was a building here. If I find out what it is, I'll put it at the bottom of the screen. But the foundations still stand and probably will stand for a long, long time. Again, as we saw early on the walk, this is where we started, you've got this airfield concrete base that shows this was built by the Americans. And if we carried on, it crossed the runway onto the airfield. But we'll call it a day there. Coming up to the water tower where we started. That's it, back to the start. I quite enjoyed that one, apart from it was a bit too windy and there's one or two stretches on the road that I would rather not have walked along but had to do it to get to where I was going to. I saw a few things I've not seen before so it was well worthwhile. I hope you enjoyed some of it at least. Um, next week, well, I hope it's not as windy. And I think I might try and avoid traffic noise next week and get back to uh, country walks more than this one was. Ha! <laughs>